Good evening. And thank you so much for this opportunity to be in my presence and to hear you speak about this, this subject. The reason why I'm here is I grew up in Rochester, New York, and I've always had a fascination with Frederick Douglass in my whole entire life. And uh, recently, well, I guess one year ago, this time, there was a uh, leaders and literacy breakfast at uh, the Cotton Room in Durham. And the president of the university brought his spoke. And in his speech, he referenced Frederick Douglass. So I stood up and I perked up and I wanted to hear what he had to say. But basically, he, he said what you said as far as his legacy about being able to educate himself and how important education was to changing a person's life. And that's what they do at the Durham Literacy Center. And so I volunteered there to help uh, young people get their GED. Because I'm also a school teacher in the Durham Public Schools, and I believe that reading is the single most determining factor of a child's future success. And so um, now I am in grad school pursuing a Master of Library and Information Science. And so now I'm really interested in curating um, information digitally about Frederick Douglass because one of my goals in life is to obliterate illiteracy. I think illiteracy leads to a lot of the social problems that exist. So if we're able to obliterate illiteracy, then maybe we would have human trafficking. Maybe people would live successful lives and be able to take care of themselves if they were not illiterate. And so I want to empower people. I actually want to start my own library. Um, combination of a library and a bookstore. But in the meantime, while I'm going to grad school, I want to create a website or a portal, all things Frederick Douglass, to let people know the power of being able to educate yourself and that you can overcome illiteracy. You can be a great, phenomenal person and make a difference in the world. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And thank you for that very important work. And Frederick, well, and on behalf of the family of Frederick, thank you for wanting to and caring enough to want to teach about his life and legacy and his importance and his contributions. Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you will forever be free. And so with a project like this, we understand that we're meeting um, students and young people at different levels of reading. Some will pick up the book and they'll read it right away. We, we want to do everything we can to support them so that they don't make it a doorstop or let it gather dust on their shelves. And so there's a Frederick Douglass curriculum that is, comes along with the project. It's K through 12, and then we also have college level. And it's age-appropriate excerpts and conversation starters in the classroom. And then we spend a lot of our time traveling to schools all over this country. I've been in more schools since January than I can count. But getting them interested just to want to dive into the book. And we've been able to see young people pick it up and you know, turn it upside down and look around and look at the photographs we put. Some of the family photographs that you see up here are in the book as well. But uh, we, are, we believe the same thing. And if we go back to the legacy of slavery and keeping enslaved Africans uneducated, that, that, was, that was the reason. And, and it's so different today. You know, we, we, when we look at the Department of Education and what's happening with trying to privatize education and really the dumbing down of our country and trying to just give us just enough education to keep us from asking questions, asking critical questions. And so we always believe that Frederick Douglass's narrative should be required reading in every school. I understand why it's not, but we, we figured if it's not, that we're going to give it to this young people anyway, so that they can know the true history, not the whitewashed history that we've been taught in this country where the contributions of of Native Americans and, and people of African descent have been erased or presented safe. I mean, when we think about Frederick Douglass, he, what history has given us is the safe grandfatherly figure, the statesman looking away from the camera, not the radical abolitionist who was by design looking directly in the camera and saying, I never want to look like a happy, amiable fugitive. That might inspire somebody to want to change their condition to look at that. And even with with Dr. King, I mean, Dr. Cornell West tells us the same thing. That he's, we've been given a, as he says, a, a, a deodorized, sanitized Dr. King. Nat Turner, he's not held up as a revolutionary by the family fathers. 
who were fighting against tyranny and oppression, but Nat Turner would put the language of the world rebellion on it to make it a bad thing. We call runaway slaves and fugitive slaves to make it sound like they're doing something wrong when what they were doing, they were breaking the fugitive slave law of 1850, but what they were doing was stealing themselves. But if we call them freedom seekers, talking about the same person, now they're placed into the narrative of freedom in this country where they should be. So there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you for your work. Please let us know how we can help and support what you're doing. Thank you. Well, if you've read the narrative, um, you'll know that Frederick Douglass didn't just overcome illiteracy and he blew it away. I, I mean, <laughs> this is, uh, we're sort of giving these away beginning at age 12 or however young. If kids can't, read the content, it, at least they can feel the cover and the embossing and, and look at the pictures. But uh, once you can read the content with the help of a, uh, a search engine, it's powerful. It, it's powerful. So Robert, we probably have time for maybe one other question. Uh, it would be good if we could stay here all night. So we can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we can. <Let's> <laughs> Come on, come on up here, please. 
I want you to, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> because I imagine this is what Frederick Douglass must have looked like. And I've been told by his mother that he is a Frederick Douglass fan, and he, at this young age, is out there teaching his peers and his classmates about the importance of Frederick Douglass. So tell the audience your name, and just briefly tell us what you've been doing with your Frederick Douglass project. Um, hi, I'm um, Eric Kyle Jr. I am from Cary, North Carolina, and in my school at High Park Journal Elementary, I, am, I was in a project where you had to choose a famous person that was involved in America, and I chose Freddie Douglas because I know he did a great job in influencing um, African Americans and influencing me. And I did a project on him, and I taught my classmates about him and about all the books he wrote and all his quotes and his speeches and all that stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So, on behalf of the family of Frederick Douglass, again, we thank you. But I know that every classroom that I go into, there's a young Frederick Douglass. There's a Sojourner Truth. There's a Harry Tubman. There's a Susan B. Anthony. There's a Cesar Chavez. Take your freedom by your choice. They're sitting in our classrooms all around the country. And Eric is a perfect example of why we do what we do. Because when he, we're not gonna have to repair a broken man. We're gonna build a strong children. And he's going uh, his way, way to being built as a strong child. So thank you for coming tonight. And mom, thank you for bringing me. Thank you so much, uh, Ken and Robert, and let us give them another round of applause. <laughs> the evening is not over. Uh, I do have a couple of housekeeping announcements. First of all, uh, we do have copies of that special bicentennial edition of Frederick Douglass's transformative 1845 slave narrative to uh, provide to some of you. So we have to have a system, we don't have enough for everybody, so we have to have a system for how we go about doing this. Oh, and, and I, I mean, actually, we have some help. And so what, what we plan to do, what, what I'll do first, and uh, I have certainly heard Ken loud and clear, young people first. So, um, what I, I told him you were going to get in trouble. Yeah, yeah, I was going to get in trouble. Get in trouble. So, so, what I'm going to say is anybody under the age of 18, raise your hand. <laughs> raise your hand and let us make sure we get books to all of those individuals. Now, one of the things that we have done as a part of this uh, planning process is that we have made books available to over 800 children uh, in the Chapel Hill Carborough School System and the Orange County Schools. So we have certainly focused on making sure that young people in Orange County get a copy of, of, this, uh, of this book. Uh, so, do we have any other people of that age group? One boy, there's one in the back. Okay, okay, all right. So once we do that, we're gonna go to a more, uh, some might say, democratic process. Uh, so I have here a bag, and don't get, don't get all upset, the bag says Duke Law. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do is ask you, we're giving pieces of paper and ask you to write your names on the pieces of paper. So we're going to pass the bag around, ask you to put your name in the bag, and we're just going to choose names. And, we're, and as that is happening, I did want to mention a couple of other things. Um, first of all, I, my name is James Williams, by the way, and I, I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself. And uh, I'm first vice president of Chapter of Carpenter on NAACP. I do want to take a moment 
to thank our sponsors. They are listed on the back of your program, uh, but uh, I, I do think it makes sense to call their names. Uh, Chapel Carborough NAACP, the Town of Chapel Hill, the Town of Car uh, Carborough, Orange County, Organizing Against Orange, Organizing Against Racism Alliance, Chapel Hill Downtown Partnership, Orange County Public Library, Chapel Hill Public Library, and the Center for the Study of the American South. These events don't just happen. The series of events that we planned in celebration of the 200th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Douglass didn't just happen. A lot of work and effort went into the process. And I know that there are some members of the planning committee that are here. So if you'll stand and let us you know, acknowledge and thank you for your efforts. Yeah. For me, it was a labor of love, and I'm sure it was for the others involved also. Uh, so as we, when we leave here, we will retire for a reception and an opportunity for those of you who have books and want them autographed by Ken and Robert, you'll have a chance to do that. There are also some refreshments, and there is an exhibit, Tony, um, I was about to say Tony Morrison, but <laughs> Tony Scott's uh, art exhibit related to slavery in an exhibit room right next door, I mean right next to this space. So you can have an opportunity to view that also. So do we have the names in the bags yet? Okay. So what I, what, what I will do is ask of you, if you are an adult, anyone over the age of 21, let's say, and you get one of these books, make an effort to share it with some young person, even if you only loan it to them. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, right. Um, so, okay. This world? That's it? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's see. For a limited time. Yeah, let me see. We try to make it as hard as possible. So, uh, get your hands on the mic. <laughs> We're working on the audio book now. It's finished. Uh, we just need to uh, get it totally complete. <laughs> it's, a, it's an executive from the, uh, from the California Department of Education who is very Morgan Freeman-esque. <laughs> Kalani. Yes. 